Ulysses by James Joyce, section 10a. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Hugh McGuire. Kara Schallenberg. And Mike Trevino. Chapter 10. The superior, very reverend John Conmee, S.J., reset his smooth watch in his interior pocket as he came down the presbytery steps. Five to three. Just nice time to walk to Artain. What was that boy's name again? Dignum, yes. Vere dignum et justum est. Brother Swan was the person to see. Mr. Cunningham's letter. Yes, oblige him if possible, good practical Catholic, useful at mission time. A one-legged sailor, swinging himself onward by lazy jerks of his crutches, growled some notes. He jerked short before the convent of the Sisters of Charity and held out a peaked cap for alms towards the very Reverend John Conmee, S.J. Father Conmee blessed him in the sun for his purse held, he knew, one silver crown. Father Conmee crossed to Mountjoy Square. He thought, but not for long, of soldiers and sailors whose legs had been shot off by cannonballs, ending their days in some pauper ward, and of Cardinal Wolsey's words. If I had served my God as I had served my king, he would not have abandoned me in my old days. He walked by the tree shade of sunny winking leaves, and towards him come the wife of Mr. David Sheehy, M.P., very well indeed, father. And you, father? Father Conmee was wonderfully well indeed. He would go to Buxton, probably, for the waters. And her boys, were they getting on well at Belvedere? Was that so? Father Conmee was very glad indeed to hear that. And Mr. Sheehy himself, still in London. The house was still sitting, to be sure it was. Beautiful weather it was, delightful indeed. Yes, it was very probable that Father Bernard Vaughan would come again to preach. Oh, yes, a very great success. A wonderful man, really. Father Conmee was very glad to see the wife of Mr. David Sheehy, M.P., looking so well, and he begged to be remembered to Mr. David Sheedy, M.P. Yes, he would certainly call. Good afternoon, Mrs. Sheehy. Father Conmee doffed his silk hat as he took leave, at the jet beads of her mantilla ink-shining in the sun, and smiled yet again in going. He had cleaned his teeth, he knew, with arcanut paste. Father Conmee walked, and walking, smiled, for he thought on Father Bernard Vaughan's droll and cockney voice. Pilot, why don't you hold back that owling mob? A zealous man, however, really he was, and really did good in his way, beyond a doubt. He loved Ireland, he said, and he loved the Irish. Of good family, too, would one think it? Welsh, were they not? Oh, lest he forget the letter to the father provincial. Father Conmee stropped three little schoolboys on the corner of Mount Joy Square. Yes, they were from Belvedere, the little house, aha! And were they good boys at school? Oh, that was very good now. And what was his name? Jack Soham. And his name? Gurr. Gallagher. And the other little man? His name was Bruni Lynam. Oh, that was a very nice name to have. Father Conmee gave a letter from his breast to Master Bruni Lynam, and pointed to the red pillar box on the corner of Fitzgibbon Street. But mind you don't post yourself into the box, little man, he said. The boy six-eyed Father Conmee and laughed. Oh, sir. Well, let me see if you can post a letter, Father Conmee said. Master Bruni Lynam ran across the road and put Father Conmee's letter to Father Provincial into the mouth of the bright red letter-box. Father Conmee smiled and nodded and smiled and walked along Mount Joy Square East. Mr. Dennis J. McGinney, professor of dancing and company in silk hat, slate frock coat with silk facings, white kerchief tie, tight lavender trousers, canary gloves and pointed patent boots, 
walking with grave deportment, most respectfully took the curbstone as he passed Lady Maxwell at the corner of Dignam's Court. Was that not Mrs. McGuinness? Mrs. McGuinness, stately, silver-haired, bowed to Father Conmey from the farther footpath along which she sailed, and Father Conmey smiled and saluted. How did she do? A fine carriage she had, like Mary, Queen of the Scots, something. And to think she was a pawnbroker, well now, such a, what should he say, such a queenly mane. Father Conmey walked down Great Charles Street and glanced at the shut-up free church on his left. The Reverend T. R. Green, B. A., Will, D. V., Speak. The incumbent, they called him. He felt it incumbent on him to say a few words. But one should be charitable, invincible ignorance. They acted according to their lights. Father Conmey turned the corner and walked along the north circular road. It was a wonder that there was not a tram-line in such an important thoroughfare. Surely there ought to be. A band of satcheled schoolboys crossed from Richmond Street, all raised untidy caps. Father Conmey greeted them more than once, benightingly. Christian brother boys. Father Conmey smelled incense on his right hand as he walked. St. Joseph's Church, Portland Row. For aged and virtuous females, Father Conmey raised his hat to the blessed sacrament virtuous. But occasionally they were also bad-tempered. Near Aldborough House, Father Conmey thought of that spendthrift nobleman, and now it was an office or something. Father Conmey began walking along the North Strand Road and was saluted by Mr. William Gallagher, who stood in the doorway of his shop. Father Conmey saluted Mr. William Gallagher and perceived the odors that came from bacon flitches and ample cools of butter. He passed Grogan's, the tobacconist, against which newsboards leaned, and told of a dreadful catastrophe in New York. In America, those things were continually happening. Unfortunate people to die like that, unprepared, still an act of perfect contrition. Father Conmey went by Daniel Bergen's public house, against the window of which two unlaboring men lounged. They saluted him and were saluted. Father Conmey passed H. J. O'Neill's funeral establishment, where Corny Kelleher totted figures in the daybook, while he chewed a blade of hay. A constable on his beat saluted Father Conmey, and Father Conmey, Conmey saluted the constable. In Uke Setters, the pork butchers, Father Conmey observed pig's pudding, white, black, and red, lying neatly cubed in tubes. Moored under the trees of Charleville Mall, Father Conmey saw a turf barge, a tow-horse with pendant head, a bargeman with a hat of dirty straw, seated amidships, smoking and staring at a branch of poplar above him. It was idyllic, and Father Conmey reflected on the providence of the Creator who made turf to be in bogs where men might dig it out and bring it to town, and hamlet to make fires in the houses of poor people. On Newcomen Bridge, the very Reverend John Conmey, S.J., of St. Francis Xavier Church, Upper Gardiner Street, stepped on to an outward-bound tram. Of an inward-bound tram stepped the Reverend Nicholas Dudley, C.C., of St. Agatha's Church, North William Street, on to Newcomen Bridge. At Newcomen Bridge, Father Conmey stepped into an outward-bound tram, for he disliked to traverse on foot the dingy way past Mud Island. Father Conmey sat in a corner of the tram car, a blue ticket tucked with care in the eye of one plump kid glove, while four shillings, a sixpence, and five pennings shooted from his other plump glove palm into his purse. Passing the ivory church, he reflected that the ticket inspector usually made his visit when one had carelessly thrown away the ticket. The solemnity of the occupants of the car seemed to Father Conmey excessive for a journey so short and cheap. Father Conmey liked cheerful decorum. It was a peaceful day. The gentleman with glasses opposite Father Conmey had finished explaining and looked down. His wife, Father Conmey supposed, a tiny yawn opened the mouth of the wife of the gentleman with the glasses. She raised her small gloved fist, fist 
yawned ever so gently, tip-tapping her small gloved fist on her opening mouth and smiled tinily, sweetly. Father Conmee perceived her perfume in the car. He perceived also that the awkward man at the other side of her was sitting on the edge of the seat. Father Conmee at the altar rails placed the host with difficulty in the mouth of the awkward old man who had the shaky head. At Annesley Bridge the tram halted, and, when it was about to go, an old woman rose suddenly from her place to alight. The conductor pulled the bell-straps to stay the car for her. She passed out with her basket and market-net, and Father Comney saw the conductor help her and net the basket down. And Father Conmy thought that, as she was nearly past the end of the penny fare, she was one of those good souls who would always to be told twice, Bless you, my child, and they have been absolved, pray for me. But they had so many worries in life, so many cares, poor creatures. From the hoardings Mr. Eugene Stratton grinned with thick nigger lips at Father Conmy. Father Conmy thought of the souls of black and brown and yellow men, and of his sermon of St. Peter Calver, S.J., and the African Mission, and of the progression, propagation of the faith, and of the millions of black and brown and yellow souls that had not received the baptism of water when their last hour came like a thief in the night. That book by the Belgian Jesuit Le Nom des Élus seemed to Father Conmy a reasonable plea. Those were millions of human souls created by God in his own likeness, to whom the faith had not D.V. been brought. But they were God's soul created by God. It seemed to Father Conmee a pity that they should be lost, a waste, if one might say. At the house road, Father Conmee alighted, was saluted by the conductor, and saluted his term. The Malahide road was quiet. It pleased Father Conmee, road and name. The joy bells were ringing in gay Malahide. Lord Talbot de Malahide, intermediate, hereditary lord, admiral of Malahide and the seas adjoining. Then came the call to arms, and she was maid, wife, and widow in one day. Those were old, worldish days, loyal times in joyous townlands, old times in the barony. Father Conmy, walking, thought of his little book, Old Times in the Barony, of the book that might be written about Jesuit houses and of Mary Rochford, daughter of Lord Molesworth, first countess of Belvedere. A listless lady, no more young, walked along the shore of Loch Hanel. Mary, first countess of Belvedere, listlessly walking in the evening, not startled when an otter plunged. Who could know the truth? Not the jealous Lord Belvedere, not her confessor, if she had not committed adultery fully. Eaculatio seminis inter vas naturale mulieris, with her husband's brother. Hmm. She would half confess if she had not all sinned as women did, only God knew, and she and he, her husband's brother. Father Conmee thought of the tyrannous incontinence needed, however, for men's race on earth, and of the ways of God which were not our own ways. Don John Conmee walked and moved in times of yore. He was humane and honored there. He bore in mind secrets confessed, and he smiled at smiling noble faces in a beeswax drawing-room, sealed with full fruit clusters. And the hands of a bride and of a bridegroom, noble to noble, were empalmed by Don John Conmee. It was a charming day. The lich gate of a field showed Father Conmee breadths of cabbages, curtsying to him with ample underleaves. The sky showed him a flock of small white clouds going slowly down the wind. Mutoner, the French said. A homely and just word. Father Conmee, reading his office, watched a flock of muttoning clouds over Rath Coffee. His thin socked ankles were tickled by the stubble of Conglo's field. He walked there reading in the evening and heard the cries of the boys' lines at their play, young cries in the quiet evening. He was their rector. His reign was mild. Father Conmee drew off his gloves and took his redredged breviary out. 
An ivory bookmark told him the page, Nones. He should have read that before lunch, but Lady Maxwell had come. Father Conmy read in secret Pater and Ave, and crossed his breast, Deus in auditorium. He walked calmly and read mutely the Nones, walking and reading till he came to rest in Beati Immaculati, Principium Verborum Tuorum Veritas, in eternum omnia uisia institutiae tue. A flushed young man came from a gap of a hedge, and after him came a young woman with wild nodding daisies in her hand. The young man raised his hat abruptly. The young woman abruptly bent and with slow care detached from her light skirt a clinging twig. Father Conmy blessed both gravely and turned a thin page of his breviary. Sin, principes persecuti sunt me gratis, eta verbis tuis formidavit cor meum. Corney Kelleher closed his long day-book and glanced with his drooping eye at a pine coffin lid sentried in a corner. He pulled himself erect, went to it, and, spinning it on its axle, viewed its shape and brass furnishings. Chewing his blade of hay, he laid the coffin lid by and came to the doorway. There he tilted his hat brim to give shade to his eyes and leaned against the door case, looking idly out. Father John Comney stepped out, stepped into Dolly Mount Tram on Newcomen Bridge. Corney Kelleher locked his large footed boots and gazed, his hat down tilted, chewing his blade of hay. Constable 57C, on his belt, on his beat, stood to pass the time of day. That's a fine day, Mr. Kelleher. Aye, Corney Kelleher said. It's very close, the constable said. Corney Kelleher sped a silent jet of hay juice arching from his mouth while a generous white arm from a window in Eccles Street flung forth a coin. What's the best news? he asked. I seen that particularly party last evening, the constable said, with bated breath. A one-legged sailor crutched himself round McConnell's corner, skirting Rabiotti's ice cream cart, and jerked himself up Eccles Street. Towards Larry O'Rourke, in shirt sleeves in his door in his doorway he growled unamiably, For England. He swung himself violently forward past Katie and Booty Dedalus, halted and growled Home and Beauty. J. J. O'Malley's white careworn face was told that Mr. Lambert was in the warehouse with a visitor. A stout lady stopped, took a copper coin from her purse, and dropped it into the cap held out to her. The sailor grumbled thanks and glanced sourly at the unheeding windows, sank his head, and swung himself forward four strides. He halted and growled angrily, For England! Two barefoot urchins sucking Long licorice laces halted near him, gaping at his stump with their yellow slobbered mouths. He swung himself forward in vigorous jerks, halted, lifted his head towards a window, and bayed deeply, Home and beauty! The gay, sweet chirping, whistling within, went on, went on a bar or two, ceased. The blind of the window was drawn aside. A card, unfurnished apartment, slipped from the sash and fell. A plump, bare, generous arm shone, was seen, held forth from a white petticoat, bodice, and taut shift straps. A woman's hand flung forth a coin over the area railings. It fell on the path. One of the urchins ran to it, picked it up, and dropped it into the minstrel's cap, saying, There, sir. Katie and Booty Dedalus shoved in the door of the closed, steaming kitchen. Did you put in the books? Booty asked. Maggie at the range rammed down a grayish mass beneath bubbling suds, twice with her pot-stick, and wiped her brow. They wouldn't give anything on them, she said. Father Kami walked through Klongau's fields, his thin-socked ankles tickled by stubble. Where did you try? Booty asked. McGuinness's. Booty stamped her foot and threw her satchel on the table. 
Bad cess to her, big face, she cried. Katie went to the rang and peered with squinting eyes. What's in the pot? she asked. Shirts, Maggie said. Booty cried angrily. Crikey, is there nothing for us to eat? Katie, lifting the kettle lid in a pad of her stained skirt, asked, And what's in this? A heavy fume gushed in answer. Pea soup, Maggie said. Where did you get it? Katie asked. Sister Mary Patrick, Maggie said. The lackey rang his bell. Barang! Booty sat down at the table and said hungrily, Give it us here. Give us it here. <laughs> Maggie poured yellow thick soup from the kettle into a bowl. Katie, sitting opposite Booty, said quietly, as her fingertip lifted to her mouth random crumbs. A good job we have that much. Where's Dilly? Gone to meet father, Maggie said. Booty, breaking big chunks of bread into the yellow soup, added, Our father who art not in heaven. Maggie, pouring yellow soup in Katie's bowl, exclaimed, Booty, for shame. A skiff, a crumpled th throwaway. Elijah is coming, rode lightly down the Liffey, under Loop Line Bridge, shooting the rapids where water chafed around the bridge piers, sailing eastward past hulls and anchor chains, between the Custom House Old Dock and George's Quay. The blonde girl in Thornton's bedded the wicker basket with rustling fibre. Blazes Boylan handed her the bottle swathed in pink tissue paper and a small jar. "'Put these in first, will you?' he said. "'Yes, sir,' the blonde girl said. "'And the fruit is on top.' "'That'll do. Game ball,' Blazes Boylan said. She bestowed fat pears neatly, head by tail, and among them ripe, shame-faced peaches. Blazes Boylan walked here and there in new tan shoes about the fruit-smelling shop, lifting fruits, young, juicy, crinkled and plump red tomatoes, sniffing smells. H. E. L. Wise filed before him, tall white-hatted, past Tangier Lane, plodding toward their goal. He turned suddenly from a chip of strawberries, drew a gold watch from his fob, and held it at its chain's length. "'Can you send them by tram, now?' A dark-backed figure under Merchant's arch scanned books on the hawker's car. "'Certainly, sir. Is it in the city?' "'Oh, yes,' Blazes Boylan said. Ten minutes.' The blonde girl handed him a docket and pencil. "'Will you write the address, sir?' Blazes Boylan at the counter wrote and pushed the docket to her. "'Send it at once, will you?' he said. "'It's for an invalid.' "'Yes, sir. I will, sir.' Blazes Boylan rattled merry money in his trousers pocket. "'What's the damage?' he asked. The blonde girl's slim fingers reckoned the fruits. Blazes Boylan looked into the cut of her blouse. A young pullet. He took a red carnation from the tall stem-glass. "'This for me?' he asked gallantly. The blonde girl glanced sideways at him, got up regardless, with his tie a bit crooked, blushing. "'Yes, sir,' she said. Bending archly, she reckoned again fat pears and blushing peaches. Blazes Boylan looked in her blouse with more favour, the stalk of the red flower between his smiling teeth. "'May I say a word to your telephone, Missy?' he asked roguishly. Ma, Almidano Artifoni said. He gazed over Stefan's shoulder at Goldsmith's knobby paw. Two car, two carfuls of tourists passed slowly. Their women sitting four, gripping frankly the handrests, pale faces, men's arms frankly round their stunted forms. They looked from Trinity to the blind-columned porch of the Bank of Ireland, where pigeons rococooed. Ancio ho avuti di queste idee, Almidano Artifoni said, quando ero giovine com lei, e poi mi sono convinti che il mondo è una bestia, e peccato, perce la sua voce, sarebbe un cep cespite di rendita via, invece lei si sacrifica, 
sacrificio in cruento, Stephen said, smiling, swaying his ash plant in slow swing swung from its midpoint lightly. That would be Stephen, wouldn't it? Speriamo, the round mustachioed face said pleasantly, ma diaretta a me, si rifletta. By the stern stone hand of Grattan, bidding halt, an inchicore tram unloaded straggling highland soldiers of a band. Si riflettero, Stephen said, glancing down the solid trouser leg. Ma sul serio, eh? Almidano Artifoni said. His heavy hand took Stephen's firmly. Human eyes. They gazed curiously an instant, and turned quickly towards a dalky tram. Eccolo, Almidano Artifoni said in friendly haste. Venga a trovarmi e ci pensi. Adio, caro. Arrivederla, maestro, Stephen said, raising his hat when his hand was freed. E grazie. Dice, Almidano Artifoni said. Artifano said. Scusi, eh? Tante belle cose. Almidano Artifoni, holding up a baton of rolled music as a signal, trotted on stout trousers after the dalky tram. In vain he trotted, signalling in vain among the rout of bare-kneed gillies smuggling implements of music through Trinity Gates. Miss Dunn hid the Capel Street library copy of the, Wom the Woman in White far back in her drawer, and rolled a sheet of gaudy note-paper into her typewriter. Too much mystery business in it. Is he in love with that one, Marion? Change it, and get another by Mary Cecil Hay. The disc shot down the groove, wobbled a while, ceased, and ogled them. Six. Miss Dunn clicked on the keyboard. 16 June, 1904. Five tall white-hatted sandwich men between Monypenny's corner and the slab where Wolf Tone's statue was not, eeled themselves turning H-E-L-Y's, and plodded back as they had come. Then she stared at the large poster of Marie Kendall, charming soubrette and listlessly lolling, scribbled on the jotter sixteens and capital S's. Mustard hair and dauby cheeks. She's not nice-looking, is she? The way she is holding up her bit of a skirt. Wonder will that fellow be at the band tonight? If I could get that dressmaker to make a concertina skirt like Susie Nagel's, they kick out grand. Shannon and all the boat club swells never took his eyes off her. Hope to goodness he won't keep me here till seven. The telephone rang rudely by her ear. Hello? Yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, sir. I'll ring them up after five. Only those two, sir, for Belfast and Liverpool. All right, sir. Then I can go after six if you're not back. A quarter after. Yes, sir. Twenty-seven and six. I'll tell him. Yes. One, seven, six. She scribbled three figures on an envelope. Mr. Boylan, hello. That gentleman from Sport was in looking for you. Mr. Lenahan, yes. He said he'll be in the Ormond at four. No, sir. Yes, sir. I'll ring them up after five. Two pink faces turned in the flare of the tiny torch. Who's that? Ned Lambert asked. Is that Crotty? Ringabella and Crosshaven, a voice replied, groping for foothold. Hello, Jack. Is that yourself? Ned Lambert said, raising in salute his pliant lath among the flickering arches. Come on, mind your steps there. The vesta in the clergyman's uplifted hand consumed itself in a long soft flame, and was let fall. At their feet its red speck died, and mouldy air closed round them. "'How interesting!' a refined accent said in the gloom. "'Yes, sir,' Ned Lambert said heartily. "'We are standing in the historic council chamber of St. Mary's Abbey, where Silken Thomas proclaimed himself a rebel in 1534. This is the most historic spot in all Dublin. Oh, Madden Burke is going to write something about it one of these days. The old Bank of Ireland was over the way till the time of the Union, and the original Jews' temple was here too before they built their synagogue over in Adelaide Road. You were never here before, Jack, were you? No, Ned. He rode down through Dame Walk, the refined accent said, if my memory serves me. 
The mansion of the Kildares was in Thomas Court. That's right, Ned Lambert said. That's quite right, sir. If you will be so kind, then, the clergyman said, the next time to allow me, perhaps. Certainly, Ned Lambert said. Bring the camera whenever you like. I'll get those bags cleared away from the windows. You can take it from here or from here. In the still faint light he moved about, tapping with his lath the pile of seed-bags and points of vantage on the floor. From a long face a beard and gaze hung on a chessboard. "'I'm deeply obliged, Mr. Lambert,' the clergyman said. "'I won't trespass on your valuable time.' "'You're welcome, sir,' Ned Lambert said. "'Drop in whenever you like. Ni next week, say? Can you see?' "'Yes, yes. Good afternoon, Mr. Lambert. Very pleased to have met you.' "'Pleasure's mine, sir,' Ned Lambert answered. He followed his guest to the outlet, and then whirled his lath away among the pillars. With J. J. O'Malloy he came forth slowly into Mary's Abbey, where draymen were loading floats with sacks of carob and palm-nut meal, O'Connor, Wexford. He stood to read the card in his hand. The Reverend Hugh C. Love, Rathcoffey, present address, St. Michael's, Salins. Nice young chap he is. He's writing a book about the Fitzgeralds, he told me. He's well up in history, faith. The young woman, with slow care, detached from her light skirt a clinging twig. "'I thought you were at a new gunpowder plot,' J. J. O'Malloy said. Ned Lambert cracked his fingers in the air. "'God!' he cried. "'I forgot to tell him that one about the Earl of Kildare after he set fire to Cashel Cathedral. You know that one? I'm bloody sorry I did it,' says he. "'But I declare to God I thought the Archbishop was inside. He mightn't like it, though. What?' "'God, I'll tell him anyhow. "'That was the great Earl, the Fitzgerald Moore. "'Hot members they were, all of them, the Geraldines.' "'The horses he passed started nervously under their slack harness. "'He slapped a piebald haunch quivering near him and cried, "'Whoa, Sonny!' "'He turned to J. J. O'Malloy and asked, "'Well, Jack, what is it? What's the trouble? "'Wait a while. Hold hard.' With gaping mouth and head far back he stood still, and, after an instant, sneezed loudly. Chow, he said. "'Blast you!' "'The dust from those sacks,' J. J. O'Malloy said politely. "'No!' Ned Lambert gasped. "'I caught a cold night before. Blast your soul! Night before last! And there was a hell of a lot of draught!' He held his handkerchief ready for the coming. "'I was, this morning—' Poor little, what do you call him? Cha! Mother of Moses! Tom Rochford took the top disc from the pile he clasped against his claret waistcoat. See, he said, say it's turn six. In here, see. Turn now on. He slid it into the left slot for them. It shot down the groove, wobbled a while, ceased, ogling them. Six. Lawyers of the past, haughty, pleading, beheld pass from the consolidated taxing office to Nisi Prius Court, Richie Golding carrying the cost-bag of Golding, Collis, and Ward, and heard rustling from the Admiralty Division of King's Bench to the Court of Appeal, an elderly female with false teeth, smiling incredulously, and a black silk skirt of great amplitude. "'See,' he said, See now, the last one I put in is over here, turns over. The impact, leverage, see? He showed them the rising column of discs on the right. Smart idea, Nosy, fin Nosy Flynn said, snuffling. So a fellow coming in late can see what turn is on and what turns are over. See? Tom Rochford said. He slid in a disc for himself and watched it shoot, wobble, ogle, stop. Four. Turn now on. I'll see him now in the Ormond, Lenahan said, and sound him. One good turn deserves another. Do, Tom Rochford said. Tell him I'm boiling with impatience. Good night, McCoy said abruptly, when you two begin. Nosy Flynn stooped towards the lever, snuffling at it. But how does it work here, Tommy? he asked. Turaloo, Lenahan said. See you later. 
he followed McCoy out across the tiny square of Crampton Court. "'He's a hero,' he said simply. "'I know,' McCoy said. "'The drain, you mean?' "'Drain?' Lenahan said. It was down a manhole. They passed Dan Lowry's music hall, where Marie Kendall, charming soubrette, smiled on them from a poster, a dauby smile. Going down the path of Sycamore Street beside the Empire Music Hall, Lenahan showed McCoy how the whole thing was. One of those manholes like a bloody gas-pipe, and there was the poor devil stuck down in it half-choked with sewer gas. Down went Tom Rochford anyhow, bookie's vest and all, with the rope round him. And be damned, but he got the rope round the poor devil, and the two were hauled up. The act of a hero, he said. At the Dolphin they halted to allow the ambulance car to gallop past them for Jervis Street. This way, he said, walking to the right. I want to pop into Linham's to see Scepter's starting price. What's the time by your gold watch and chain? McCoy peered into Marcus Tertius Moses's sombre office, then at O'Neill's clock. "'After three, he said. "'Who's riding her?' "'Oh, Madden,' Lenahan said. "'And a game filly she is.' While he waited in Temple Bar, McCoy dodged a banana peel with gentle pushes of his toe from the path to the gutter. Fellow might damn easy get a nasty fall there, coming along tight in the dark. The gates of the drive opened wide to give egress to the viceregal cavalcade. "'Even money,' Lenahan said, returning. "'I knocked against Bantam Lyons in there, going to back a bloody horse someone gave him that hasn't an earthly. Through here.' They went up the steps and under Merchant's arch. A dark-backed figure scanned books on the hawker's cart. "'There he is,' Lenahan said. "'Wonder what he is buying?' McCoy said, glancing behind. "'Leopoldo, or the bloom is on the rye,' Lenahan said. "'He's dead nuts on sales,' McCoy said. "'I was with him one day, and he bought a book from an old one in Liffey Street for two bob. There were fine plates in it, worth double the money, the stars and the moon, and comets with long tails. Astronomy it was about.' Lenahan laughed. "'I'll tell you a damn good one about comets' tails,' he said. "'Come over in the sun.' They crossed to the metal bridge and went along Wellington Quay by the river wall. Master Patrick Aloysius Dignam came out of Mangan's, late Fahrenbach, carrying a pound and a half of pork steaks. There was a big spread out at Glencree Reformatory, Lenahan said eagerly. The annual dinner, you know, boiled shirt affair. The Lord Mayor was there, Val Dillon it was, and Sir Charles Cameron and Dan Dawson spoke, and there was music. Bartell Darcy sang, and Benjamin Dollard. "'I know,' McCoy broke in. "'My missus sang there once.' "'Did she?' Lenahan said. A card, Unfurnished Apartments, reappeared on the window-sash of Number 7 Eccles Street. He checked his tail a moment, but broke out in a wheezy laugh. "'But wait till I tell you,' he said. "'Della Hunt of Camden Street had the catering, and yours truly was chief bottle-washer.' Bloom and the wife were there, lashings of stuff we put up, port wine and sherry and caracoa, to which we did ample justice. Fast and furious it was. After liquids came solids, cold joints galore and mince pies. I know, McCoy said, the year the missus was there. Lenahan linked his arm warmly. But wait till I tell you, he said. We had a midnight lunch, too, after all the jollification, and when we sallied forth it was blue o'clock the morning after the night before. Coming home it was a gorgeous winter's night on the Featherbed Mountain. Bloom and Chris Callanan were on one side of the car, and I was with the wife on the other. We started singing glees and duets, low the early beam of morning. She was well primed with a good load of Delahunt's port under her belly-band. Every jolt the bloody car gave I had her bumping up against me, Hell's delights! She has a fine pair, God bless her, like that! He held his caved hands a cubit from him, frowning. I was tucking the rug under her and settling her boa all the time, know what I mean? His hands moulded ample curves of air. He shut his eyes tight in delight, his body shrinking, and blew a sweet chirp from his lips. 
"'The lad stood to attention anyhow,' he said with a sigh. "'She's a gamey mare, and no mistake.' Bloom was pointing out all the stars and the comets in the heavens to Chris Callanan and the Jarvie, the great bear and Hercules and the dragon and the whole jing-bang lot. But by God I was lost, so to speak, in the Milky Way. He knows them all, Faith. At last she spotted a weeny-weeshy one miles away. And what star is that, Poldy? says she. By God she had Bloom cornered. That one, is it? says Chris Callanan. "'Sure, that's only what you might call a pinprick. "'By God, he wasn't far wide of the mark.' "'Lenahan stopped and leaned on the river wall, "'panting with soft laughter. "'I'm weak,' he gasped. "'McCoy's white face smiled about it at instants and grew grave. "'Lenahan walked on again. "'He lifted his yachting cap and scratched his hind head rapidly. "'He glanced sideways in the sunlight at McCoy.' "'He's a cultured all-round man, Bloom is,' he said seriously. "'He's not one of your common or garden, you know. "'There's a touch of the artist about old Bloom.' "'Mr. Bloom turned over idly pages of the awful disclosures of Maria Monk, "'and then of Aristotle's masterpiece, crooked botched print, "'plates, infants cuddled in a ball, in blood-red wombs like livers of slaughtered cows lots of them like that at this moment all over the world all budding with their skulls to get out of it child born every minute somewhere mrs purefoy he laid both books aside and glanced at the third tales of the ghetto by leopold von sacher massock that i had he said pushing it by the shopman let two volumes fall on the counter them are two good ones, he said. Onions of his breast, breath came across the counter out of his ruined mouth. He bent to make a bundle of the other books, hugged them against his unbuttoned waistcoat, and bore them off behind the dingy curtain. On O'Connell Bridge many persons observed the grave deportment and gay apparel of Mr. Dennis J. McGinney, professor of dancing and company. Mr. Bloom alone looked at the titles. Fair Tyrants by Lane James Lovebirch. No, the kind, that is. Had it? Yes. He opened it. Thought so. A woman's voice behind the dingy curtain. Listen. The man. No. She wouldn't like that much. Got her at once. He read the other titles. Sweets of Sin. More in her line. Let us see. He read where his finger opened. All the dollar bills her husband gave her were spent in the stores on wondrous gowns and costliest frillies. For him. For Raoul. Yes, this, here, try. Her mouth glued on his in a luscious, voluptuous kiss while his hands felt for the opulent curves inside her déshabillé. Yes, take this, the end. You are late, he spoke hoarsely, eyeing her with suspicious glare. The beautiful woman threw off her stable-trimmed wrap, displaying her queenly shoulders and heaving and bon point. An imperceptible smile played round her perfect lips as she turned to him calmly. Mr. Bloom read again, the beautiful woman. Warmth showered gently over him, cowing his flesh. Flesh yielded amid rumpled clothes, whites of eyes swooning up. His nostrils arched themselves for prey, melting breast ointments for him, for Raoul, armpits onion oniony sweat. Fish gluey slime, her heaving umbon point. Feel, press, crished sulphur dung of lions. Young, young. An elderly female, no more young, left the building of the courts of chancery, king's bents, exchequer, and common pleas, having heard in the Lord Chancellor's court the case in lunacy of Potterton. In the admirability divisions of the summons, ex parte motion of the owners of lady cairns versus the owners of barque mona in the court of appeal reservation of judgment in the case of harvey versus the ocean accident and guarantee corporation flemmy coughs shook the air of the bookshop bulging out the dingy curtains the shopman's uncombed gray head came out and his unshaven reddened face coughing he raked his throat rudely, spat phlegm on the floor. He put his boot on what he had spat, wiping the sole along it, and bent, 
showing a raw skin crown, scantily haired. Mr. Bloom beheld it. Mastering his troubled breath, he said, I'll take this one. The shopman lifted eyes, bleared with old broom. Sweets of sin, he said, tapping on it. That's a good one. End of Ulysses, section 10A.